Good morning, everyone. 11 o'clock PIL. So I think we can start with the, our webinar. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Luisa Ferreira and I'm the head of the social program at the IB Institute. And this is one webinar in the series of webinars we've been developing targeting social entrepreneurs and our SIT alumni. It's really a pleasure to, for those that uh, don't know Kim, that will be your uh, speakers today. This is uh, one webinar in a series of two on tools for communicating for impact. The two uh, webinars are independent, but they are part of the same toolbox on how to have better tools to improve your communication skills. Many of you already know Kim because Kim has been working with us and the SIT alumni for the last several years. But for those that don't know, Kim is a communication coach and she's also a lecturer at the Institute of Fundraising in the UK. Before I give the mic to Kim, I would just like to go through some, uh, some notes uh, on the webinar. And the first one is, this webinar is being recorded, and in a few days, it will be available in our YouTube channel, together with all the webinars we've been developing for the SIT alumni. So you can see them all uh, in our YouTube channel. Second, there are several ways that you can interact with us. You can use the raising hand option. You can use giving other type of feedback, or you can use chat and Q&A. Please, when you use chat and or Q&A, use the option sent to all panelists. And if at the end of the webinar, when we open for Q&A, you have questions, please use Q&A rather than chat. Uh, we want, uh, Kim uh, was discussing with us and she would like this webinar at certain points to be interactive. So if you would like to participate in the webinar when she asks for your participation, just send us a message through chat to all panelists, and then we can give you the, the panelists right and you can join live the, the webinar. I think I didn't forget anything. So now I invite Kim to, uh, to take the mic and share with us some tips on how to communicate with the more impact. Thank you. Thanks so much, Louisa. Um, and I'm, uh, as Louisa said, I really would love this to be nice and interactive. Um, at the moment, with my screen, I can't quite see the chat box. So I'm going to ask Louisa to share anything that you are popping in, or I might just pop out and reorder my screen. Um, but I'm so delighted to have this time with you. It is a very, very warm and sticky morning in London. I hope you are comfortable wherever you are this morning. We're going to take this time together to um, really look at what is a communication mindset? Because we talk about like what is good communication and good communication skills. But what's the difference between a communication skill and a communication mindset? And then we're going to look at why does communication get messy? You know, why, why does it go wrong or just not as powerful as it could be? And then we're going to look at um, some lovely quick tips on how you can pre prepare your communication mindset skills. And then, as Louisa said, we'll go through and uh, answer any questions that you might have and round up with a little poll at the end of our time together. So without further ado, let's dive in. Uh, so what is a communication mindset? Well, what we're talking about is personal communication. So this is all the interaction that you are making either on the phone, by email, text message, um, things that you are uh, choosing to write even onto your website. But it's looking at what is the source of all of this. and when we talk about communication, typically, we tend to think about it's a series of words that we select to use, and we then arrange them in a particular order. And that order is arranged either on a page or it's ordered how we in how we speak. And then also there's the element of, especially when we're speaking, 
how those words come across, so how they're delivered, everything from the volume and the tone and the pitch, uh, the pace of how they come out. And of course, our body language factors into all of that as well. Now, the reason why I get really excited about talking about communication mindset is because even with all of those factors of what are the words, how are they arranged, how are they coming out if they're being spoken, those words have to come from something. And that something is typically you. It's the source of those words is a person. And that's the thing that gets me talking about what is communication mindset, because communication has a source, typically you. It's not a dictionary. It's maybe somebody else will talk about that in a moment. But the, the source of everything is a human being. So the mindset or the state that somebody is in completely influences the words that they're able to find, how they are ordered, and how they come across when they're delivered. And let's have a closer look at why that happens. Um, and before, well, actually, before I dive into why that's happening, I just wanted to mention the difference and the distinction then between powerful communication mindset and a regular communication mindset. Now, the distinction for me is that a powerful communication mindset is when we are alert. We're totally and utterly conscious of the mindset that we are in rather than operating on autopilot, which is what most of us tend to do when we get up and uh, run the show. So this cat is here to remind you that, you know, communication mindset, one thing, but powerful communication mindset is where you are completely alert to the state that you are in before you start communicating. Now, as I said, the opposite is when we're on autopilot and we literally just get up, start sending the email, pick up the phone, start the conversation, and we don't check at all what state we're in. Now, how many of you would say, well, let's have a little show of hands. Can you pop into the chat box for me? Do you think that most of the time you start your communication, whether it's emails or phone calls or Zoom calls, um, or face-to-face -face conversations, or just preparing documents and reports, how many of you start from autopilot of you just sit down and start writing, or you start typing, or you start talking, or how many of you think you might bring a bit of consciousness to your mindset before you start doing that? So pop into the box. Do you think maybe you're a bit like the cat? You're completely aware of the mindset and the state that you're in, or are you working on autopilot? So let me have a look. And whilst you do that, you're just going to excuse me. I'm just going to pop out because I really just want to be able to see some of this chat if I can. I'll pop back. Beautiful. Okay. So into that chat box. Let me know. Are you working on autopilot or conscious? So I love some of you saying I'm more conscious if I'm talking directly to the people. And if you're writing, yeah, it's so often, you know, you sit down, send the email, you don't check the state of your mind before you do that so often. Any others of you operating on autopilot or I'm really conscious of my mindset before I go? Have a little think about it. I love uh, some of you saying more like the cat. If you're more like the cat, I'm loving this. This is brilliant. But I know that a lot of the time I start the day on autopilot, unless I stop myself. So I really have to be careful. And the reason why I want you to be really careful of communicating on autopilot is because of this. And that we mentioned this in the blurb for the webinar, that communication gets really messy when we're in autopilot because of polyvagal theory. Now, I don't know if any of you have come across polyvagal theory. Give me a, a shout out in the chat of a yes, I've heard of it, or a no if you haven't. Um, but Dr. Stephen Porges was one of the groundbreaking researchers into the polyvagal nerve. And 
basically the theory that he's created helps us to understand that what we think and how we feel emotionally is linked to our autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is uh, everything that controls the stuff that we don't think about on a regular basis. It's uh, making your lungs open and close. It's swallowing, blinking, your digestive system, uh, your heartbeat. You know, we're not consciously going lungs, breathe, swallow. With all of that is autonomous. It's just happening without us having to be conscious of it. Um, what he's shown is that it's not just that our thoughts and our emotions affect those things. And you know that if you're feeling, if you're thinking stressful thoughts or your emotions are stressful, you know your heart rate might go up, your hands might get sweaty, you might start breathing faster because this is your brain sending signals for we're not safe. So you're preparing your body to be unsafe. And in fact, we spend a lot of time in our modern world feeling very unsafe and stressed. Um, and that has a really hectic uh, impact on our bodies. But also what we now know is that it has an impact on our creativity, our memory, our ability to find the right words to use. It has an impact on our ability to concentrate, on how our words sound when they come out of our mouth because of the contraction of our throat our mu the muscles in our faces, it affects uh, our facial expression, it affects even our handwriting, if we're having to write something, it affects our ability to choose the right words. So what we start to really notice is that this physical, this state of being or this mindset has an enormous impact on how we are able to communicate. Uh, sometimes I work with clients and they say, I've just got a mental block. I don't know how to say this. And one of my first questions is, well, what's your mindset? Because a mental block indicates to me that there's a focus on things that are not helpful or stressful and the emotions are not happy, helpful emotions. And that's part of the problem of not being able to find the right words to make the communication. So this is a hugely important thing if we're going to be really self-sufficient with our communication. And we start to also see that sometimes people say to me, you know what, Kim, well, it's not that I'm entirely on autopilot. Sometimes I do stop myself and say, I'm just going to check in and see what information is it that I want to share today. You know, like I'm sending a message or I'm about to have a phone call with someone. I do stop and check what do I need to share with them? Like, that's absolutely great. Um, it's a really nice place to stop and consider things. But even the information you want to share is still then the logical part of what you need to do to get the stuff you have to communicate. But it still isn't considering the source of where that information is going to come from. So we want to really get you thinking about um, how can we get you to a place where you are not in this place of stress or fright, flight, freeze, but we can get you into a place of actually like almost like focus, the focus of your thoughts and the focus of your emotions is one of safety that allows you to be a really powerful communicator. So one of the things I would say, recapping, that when communication gets really messy and we are in this autopilot phase, is that a lot of the time we start to find that we're using somebody else's agenda or somebody else's set of words, and we're not really that comfortable or fully connected with them. I don't know if any of you uh, have ever had that, can relate to that. Perhaps you work for an organization and there is a communications department and they pull together, this is how we talk about ourselves as an organization. And the words just don't really sound like you. And as a result, it can come across as very disjointed, very inauthentic. Um, I see a lot of uh, teams 
preparing a beautiful script for the website and then trying to make sure that they're using the same language every time they're communicating in any other place, which of course is great for brand consistency, but isn't great for powerful communicating and authentic communicating. So one of the, the things we really want to make sure is that we understand all the words that we're using and that we are emotionally connected with them when we're saying them. Because otherwise, it sounds very much like, you know, when someone's on autopilot, they're just saying all these words and you don't even pay attention because they're not really paying attention to them. So having words that feel like you still get across your brand and communicate it powerfully is really, really important. The other space where I see it getting really messy when we're communicating is when the words and the delivery don't quite fit the context of what we're talking about. Um, I saw a really beautiful example of this in an interview, um, which I was wanting to put in and show you the video. It's three minutes. Um, if anyone wants to see the, the clip, I can send you a link to it. But it's a, an interview of the RIM uh, European Managing Director, so RIM being the organization that creates BlackBerry. And he was being interviewed on British Morning Breakfast TV. Uh, the reason I decided not to put it in is because he's got a very thick Scottish accent and the girl interviewing him has got a very good English regional accent, which I think I'd have to translate for a lot of people listening into this webinar. But what was really brilliant is she was interviewing him about the business and why they were launching a BlackBerry product a lot later than had initially been planned. And she kept asking him the question, why are you only launching this year? Why did it not happen last year? And he, like a very good politician, just absolutely didn't answer her question. He had prepared a set of words that were what he wanted to share, but totally didn't fit the context of the conversation. So sometimes we can have these mental scripts of this is what we do as an organization, or this is my job, or this is the description of this project I'm working on, or this is what I want to have happen. But we're so caught up in the design of that language that we forget that we might be in a space where someone's asking us something very different um, that requires a different angle and a different take. And as a result of it, he got really torn to pieces on social media for this interview. Um, and he came across as fearful of the truth of why there had been a delay for the product coming out. And think about how much mistrust actually a lot of politicians breed when they're asked questions and then they just refuse to answer them. And a lot of the time it's because they're not present in the moment with a comfortable, happy mindset to manage all of those questions. And they feel instead that they have to reel off these pre-prepared answers to things. So this can be one of the big reasons why our communication can really fail in, in that context. You cannot prepare for every eventuality. You can't prepare for every conversation, every question that comes out of it. So we really want to get ourselves into a great mindset that can handle any of those things that might crop up. The other thing I see happening a lot is that sometimes people say, okay, I'm going to prepare myself mentally. I'm going to think about what do I need to share and how do I want to come across? And in doing so, this can actually start to really negatively affect people's mindsets. So if you're very happy about, I've got to share three different things in this conversation or this email, this report, and you're thinking, how do I want to come across? And you're quite clear that you maybe you want to come across as clear and confident and approachable perhaps, and you sit down and do all that great. But if you're in a space where you start to doubt that you know enough to be able to share, or you doubt that you can come across as powerfully as you want to, then all of a sudden the mindset becomes a really negative place of, uh, I can't do this, I'm the wrong person, I'm not senior enough, I'm too female, I'm not the right cut of skin, whatever. And it all starts to play into then creating a really unhealthy mindset. So that's another thing I see happening really, really frequently, where just even the consideration of how do I want this to come across can fill people up with a lot of fear, and that then becomes the source of where they're communicating from. So it all starts to unravel. 
So I wonder if anyone has experienced any of this where they've been quite conscious they've used somebody else's words or the organization's words rather than something that really felt authentically like it came from them or if they suddenly realized they didn't have the answer to that question and then they had a little bit of a freak out moment and uh, couldn't find the right words to answer or if you've seen it happen in others or even if you've had that felt that pressure yourself of oh gosh I really I don't know if I can communicate this in the most powerful way that I want to so let me know if any of you just a good yes or a no if you've um into the chat box would be lovely if you've like experienced any of those moments when communication gets messy I think like welcome to being human actually we've all probably experienced this at some point so let's go and look then at how do we make sure we are preparing our mindsets beautifully for um, any eventuality that might be coming up. And I have to say that actually this is something I'm really passionate about because when I started working with clients in communication like a decade ago, uh, a lot of my time was people coming in saying, how do I say this? what should I say to this particular person? In this situation, how should I frame this? And my mind was in a space of, I've got the answers. I can find clear words for you to communicate. I can see the, the picture and I would offer up advice on how it should be said. And I started to notice a couple of really big problems with that. One of the things is that if I provide an answer to someone, this is what you should say, and if, um, especially when we talk to our SIT participants as we're getting them ready to start pitching, you know, if I go, well, let's say it like this, well, then it sounds like me, but it doesn't sound like them. And I've noticed that uh, people who stand up and pitch and use other people's words never sound as authentic as pa and passionate and connected to those words as if it had to come from within them. Um, and not only that, of course, it just means that you might have some nice words for that one scenario, but you are not a resource for a set of words beyond that. So I'm very, very like excited about instead of telling people what they should be saying, getting them to put themselves in their best mindset because then they are the best resource. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm noticing that some of you have also said uh, that you found some of this in interviews, you prepare for a set question. And then of course, yeah, that question might come up, but then there's a whole load of questions you've got no idea might come up. It's such a good example. Interviews are such a great example for this. So let's have a look at how we get into preparing for this great, powerful communication mindset. Now, the first thing is that we stop and think about where am I communicating from? And I don't mean my bedroom or my living room or my kitchen. I mean, where within myself am I communicating from? What mindset do I have going on right now that I'm communicating from? And we're going to talk about the details of that. But really, like, it's two major factors. We're thinking about what is the focus of my thoughts as I'm preparing and what is the focus of my emotion? What emotion do I have going on right now? The second thing we have to stop and ask ourselves is, who am I communicating to? And not just like, who is my audience, i.e. their name or their demographic, but which part of that audience's personality am I communicating to? And we're going to get into some, showing you how, why that is so incredibly important that you consider the part of the audience that you are communicating to. And only then are we in a position to say, okay, now what do I want to share? What wants to come out of my mouth when I've really checked where I'm communicating from, who I'm communicating to, which part of the person I'm communicating to, and then what do I want to share? So let's get into each of um, those three things. But it's a little bit like you know, checking if you, before you stick your hand under a tap, have I turned the hot one on or the cold one on? It's really becoming much, much more present to are these helpful things or unhelpful things? Am I going to be in a good mindset? Am I focusing on the best part of these people? Or am I in a not so good place? So let's see how it starts to play out. 
Now, the first way in which we can start to do this and see the impact is this first stage of checking, where am I communicating from? So it's looking at, as I said, the two things. What is the focus of your thoughts? And what, is, what are your emotions going on? And you can check those in a couple of different ways. You can literally be like, what is the focus of my thoughts in relationship to this piece of work? Or in relationship to my team right now? Or in relationship to myself right now? And one of the ways you can become very conscious to that is a very nice quick journaling exercise. So we call this the stream of consciousness, uh, where you literally just sit down and before you send the email or you write the report, or you prepare the speech or whatever it might be, you just check what, what's, what are the thoughts in my mind right now? What am I focusing on? And one of the things you're looking at is developing what we call a wisdom of relationship with these thoughts. So if you're in a space where the focus of your thoughts is um, focused on the hard bits of your work, the parts of your team that are not working, the parts of yourself that are struggling, uh, you might see coming out in this journaling exercise, um, my, uh, my work is really boring right now, or I'm not excited about the work, or my to-do list is never-ending, uh, and it's the never-ending bit of your to-do list that's the focus. Um, or it might be that the focus is, my, yeah, my team is, I'm worried about my team working so remotely, um, I'm thinking about how are those people who are on furlough, how are they, how are they managing, uh, you know, and then even on myself, I'm focused on, gosh, I'm focused on how hard everything feels right now. That would be really, really unhelpful mindset for you to move on from. But we want to just check in and see the quality of it. And then likewise, you'll notice that because your thoughts and your emotions are completely connected, it's like little ping pong balls that go straight. Whatever the quality of thought is the, the emotion that you'll find it's connected to. So you do exactly the same thing. It's that moment to pause and reflect. What emotions am I feeling right now? And not everyone finds this easy to do. A lot of us have basically been taught or learned to switch off from our emotions as much as possible. But they're still there lurking under the surface. But again, if the emotions related to your work are stress or pressure or doubt uh, and all of that again those emotions cropping up related to yourself or maybe anxiety about talking to somebody anxiety communicating fear communicating to someone is going to have a really big impact so we've got to just take a really quick moment to just see where am I at right now this is a lovely exercise to do first thing in the morning before you start communicating with anyone. Um, you don't have to journal it as well. So if you are somebody who likes meditating, so this is one of the beautiful focuses you can do. You can literally just get that or close your eyes and do a labeling exercise. So you just label the thoughts that are coming in and you might say excitement, nervousness, planning, to-do list and you're just labeling to notice okay this is the quality of my mindset at the moment and that's so important because if we don't do that we can't shift it and make sure it's in our most powerful space to communicate and what you might start seeing is that so you'll have things like this part of the project isn't working I'm not good enough to pull this off or this isn't going to be a priority for them or Instead, you might be finding something that's a lot more helpful, like, this is so exciting, or I can't wait to share this with them, or my job is so cool, or the one that's my favorite. If you're in this mindset, you are pretty much set for great communication. I've totally got this. It's fine. I've got this. But we're going to see how, depending on which of those mindsets you might find yourself in, you might find it starts to sound very different. So... If you had, for example, a lot of doubt around people wanting to actually talk to you or communicate with you, so you're filled with focus of doubt and emotions of probably anxiety and doubt, you might communicate and say to somebody, 
I'd be pleased to tell you about the work we're doing if you've got time to talk. You know, and it's very much a if you if you can spare me some time, I'd love to be able to do that for you. But instead, if you felt like it was a real privilege to reach out and contact somebody, and you actually were really feeling emotions of pride that your team's really working really flat out and really busy. So instead of that being a problem, it was something you were proud of. If you're reaching out to make contact with someone for the first time, what you might say instead is something like, I'm so pleased to have the chance to message you. I've just been updated by our busy team. They were so proud to share the news about their ex latest project and their latest results. And you can start to notice the difference in the energy between those two things. They're both saying, can we talk? But the quality of it is totally influenced by the quality of someone's focus um, and their emotions. You also might see that sometimes the words are exactly the same. So you might have the words um, that we've got here of, I want to help you on your project. But because of this beautiful polyvagal theory, when you're in a less helpful mindset, so focused on the negative, on the challenge, on how it's never going to get any better, you may, on a phone call or a Zoom call, say something like, I want to help you on your project. But it's full of the anxiety and stress versus saying exactly the same set of words from a place and a mindset that's relaxed and confident and kind, perhaps, uh, it would come out sounding like, I want to help you on your project. You know, very, very different. So sometimes your mindset can choose the same words, but it will come out sounding completely different. And if you're on autopilot, you don't have a choice as to how it comes out. So we want to be conscious. We want to be choosing how, where the source is for how we communicate. The other second part then for us to have a look at is the part, not just where am I communicating from, my thoughts, my emotions, but who am I communicating to? So as I said before, it's not about what's their name or what's their demographic as an audience, which we typically talk about in communication. I'm talking about which part of this person's personality am I communicating to? Now, this is so important, and it really is, um, for me, the evolution of the concept of growth mindset. So many of you might have come across growth mindset before. Uh, we talk about it typically as how we've decided who we are. So uh, Carol Dweck's book on growth mindset, everyone should read it. It's brilliant. But her research shows that we can either have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And the fixed mindset was I have decided who I am, what I'm capable of doing, and that's it. It's like a sealed box. That's all I'm ever going to be. Versus growth mindset of, but I'm just not these other things yet. I could be those things. Now, what we do with growth mindset is think about it in relation to ourselves. And it's so powerful to say, well, I'm not confident yet, or I'm not uh, able to create a beautiful piece of art yet, right? So we create the opportunity and that gives us growth and learning. But our brains are really, really good at labeling and deciding, not just about ourselves, but deciding who others are as well. And this is through no fault other than being human. Our brains are wired to look for a confirmation bias. So in the first experience we have of somebody, if they came across as difficult, abrupt, nervous, uh, complicated in how they communicated perhaps, we put those labels on them to begin with. And then guess what? Our brain looks for confirmation every time we interact with them that that is the truth. So because we're only looking for that part of that person, that's the only thing we see and we start to label them. Now, if you're communicating to somebody and you've put a label on them that says, you are difficult, you are aggressive, then what happens is even if you are <coughs> in quite a good mindset yourself, your focus on your work is positive, you've got quite a lot of nice self-belief going on, 
but you know that person over there is difficult, then what happens is that your impact, the impact on your mindset starts to happen. And now you're thinking about how am I going to say this to this difficult person? And the words are totally shaped by that. Or even if you're a person who they never make time for me, you know, and now all of a sudden your words are going to be impacted by the focus on the fact that someone never makes time for you. So what we've really got to get good at is reminding ourselves that our brains can do this and making sure that we're remembering that people are multifaceted, that we are all full of the really brilliant parts of our personality and the negative parts of our personality. In fact, I was talking to someone that I coached recently and he said, I just don't do fluffy. And uh, what he was referring to is I don't do soft, gentle conversation. You know, I'm, I'm abrupt. I just get to the point. I don't take people's feelings into account very easily. And I said to him, is that true in all parts of your life, even with your family and friends? Are you like that? And he said, well, no, of course I'm like that with them. And what I had to help him see was that he does have those elements of his personality, just not calling on them in particular situations. And we're doing the same thing. We tend to assume that if someone is how they are at work, that is how they can be full stop. But instead, I want you to start from the place of everyone is everything. And you have a choice as to which part of them you communicate to. So if we start to think about putting these less, like I'm going to call them dangerous labels on people, then it's really hard to find beautiful communication with them. So let's have a look at some of those examples of how this would come out if you were only focused on like, like the worst parts of people's personalities. So what you might see as an example here on the left, uh, if someone you felt someone was quite difficult to please, you might say something like, if you'd like to speak to someone, I can arrange a time that suits you. You know, you're already thinking, they don't want to talk to me, they want to talk to someone more senior, I can arrange a time that can suit you, because you know that they're difficult. But in fact, if that difficult person was also someone who you could acknowledge and you could say, actually, what I really like about this person is that they're really bold and really brave in how they approach their work. Then if that was the focus of who you were communicating to, what you might see is that you say something like, you know what, interesting things happen when bold minds meet. I'd like to make sure you're talking to the people who are shaping our ambition and the organization. When are you next free to speak to whoever it might be? So you start communicating to the best bits of that person. Or you might see on the right-hand side of the slide uh, an example of if you felt like someone was too busy always to ever talk to you and they didn't um, value sitting down with you, you might say to this busy person, well, if you can make time available over the next week, it'd be good for us to sit down and talk about the project. You know, it's very much if you can make time, because I know how busy you are. But instead, if the focus is not on them being so busy, but the focus is on the thing you really like about them, which is their energy and their enthusiasm for their work, then you communicate to that part of them. It starts to sound like your energy for getting things done is really what we need. When's your first availability to talk to us? And again, the shape of the conversation is now completely different. So what we have to think about constantly is, how do we make sure we're in this place where we could be doing this connecting to the best parts of people? So when we start thinking about our best communication mindset, these are some of the things I really want you to be bearing in mind. My best communication mindset is the one where I'm focused on my best thoughts and I'm focused on my best emotions and I'm focused on the best parts of others, and that's the space that I start from. And I really want it so quick and easy to do, but what we're really talking about is ultimately something that we might call state shifting. 
my focus isn't in the good place and I shift it into being in a much, much more helpful place. It doesn't mean all the negative thoughts you have about yourself and all the negative thoughts you have about others aren't necessarily your experience. Like, of course those things happen. It's not that they're not, you know, part of the thing you're experiencing. It's just that they're not helpful for powerful communication. So I want you to be thinking about every morning, checking the quality of the thoughts that you're having checking the quality of the emotions you've got and thinking about what else would be more helpful for me to focus on today? Would it be more helpful for me to focus on the exciting parts, the things that I can uh, get done today instead of the whole to-do list that's never going to get done? Um, is it more helpful for me to focus on the parts of people that I really do like, love, admire, respect. In fact, that's a beautiful exercise. And so you can journal to check where you're at or do a bit of meditation to check where am I at with my mindset and what am I thinking about when I think about other people and then sit down and reshift it completely by sitting down and writing down everything that I like, love, admire, respect about myself, my work, my project, my colleagues, and everything I like, love, admire, respect about the people I'm communicating to. Now, this is a choice. It is not something that is necessarily always easily done, but if you stay focused on the unhelpful mindset and the unhelpful thoughts about other people, it totally affects your communication. It's gonna take you so much longer to get your job done than if you make the choice consciously every day to say, I'm gonna focus on in on the things that are actually going to help me get my job done really well today, help me have a really powerful mindset. So that is the, the overview of everything I wanted to share with you today. But just to recap all of this, your mindset is everything when it comes to communication. You are the source of your communication. What's going on up here and in here influences absolutely everything that you're doing. I want you to make sure you check your personal focus and your emotion. Check the focus and the emotion connected to other people. And then choose to put yourself in the most powerful place to communicate from. And of course, as this image is indicating, be completely conscious and completely present with it instead of being on autopilot. And one last thing with this is to remind you to do this through a lens of kindness and compassion for yourself. Because sometimes when you check in on the personal focus and the emotion and you check in on others, we can be really critical of ourselves. We don't get taught this stuff at school. We don't get taught this stuff at university even. And I have yet to see it part of people's induction programs as they start in uh, organizations. So be gentle, be kind to yourself, but make that choice as often as you can to put yourself into your most powerful place and enjoy it. Lovely. So Louisa, I'm going to um, move over and see if there's any questions that we've got. Thank you so much, Kim. So now, if someone would like to ask questions from Kim, if you would like to share some of your thoughts live, just write it on the chat and Denise is in the regie and she will get you in. But I just got a very nice quote from someone that said, these examples are so clear that we can start applying them directly today. So that's very inspiring. Good. Yeah, I'm so pleased. So, and I have a question for you, uh, uh, Kim, to have more examples on how to change, quote, and quote, your sentences. Lovely. I'm wondering if, um, I think that's come from Miriam, if Miriam, if you wouldn't, if you fancy having a chat with me about it, because we can maybe just do a talk about, like literally do it live with you now. Um, if you'd rather not, I can chat through it. So let us know if you're happy to do that live and we can talk through. OK, 
again if you just no problem i can appreciate we're not all in quiet spaces to be able to talk right so in terms of having more examples on how to change our sentences i want you to um literally think about and you can um maybe type this in and others if you can type it in too uh, let's take an example of um so i want you to put yourself in a space where you are feeling put the focus on everything that isn't good at work so i want you to literally just think to yourself everything that is a problem that's difficult that you don't like that you don't admire everything that you everything that you just really don't you just hate about work right now right um so i want you to think about that being the focus and i want you to think about filling your head with all the reasons why you aren't good enough to do what you're doing it's not a nice thing to do but i'm going to show you how the impact it can have and then i want you to think about who it is you're needing to communicate with and i want you to think about everything that frustrates you about them okay so we're basically forcing you to focus on the worst of everything and you probably start to know when you're really there because your body language starts to tell you that you're there it's like this sorry i wish you could see me properly at like a, but you know bad body language because connected to these thoughts and these emotions now i want you to think about um drafting a sentence to somebody you have to work with to get something to happen. And the kind of sentence that's going to come out is going to sound like, uh, you know, very short, very brief, a little bit aggressive maybe. So have a go, you can have a go at writing this either in the chat box or just down by yourself. Of what would you say to somebody if you now needed to reach out to them and get them to do something? And it might, you know, it's just going to come out sounding like, can you please just send that document to the client? Or uh, can you just call me when you've next got your availability? And if anyone wants to pop in an example of the kind of way in which they can see they structure a sentence when they're focused on all the negative. You're very welcome to put them into that chat box. But I don't want you to worry about the words that you need to say. I want you to worry instead about how I put myself into a better place. Now I'm coming into your, your chat now. So if you're very impulsive in giving feedback, go directly to the detail that you don't like. Lovely. That, but of course you do. Our brains are wired to look for the stuff we don't like. So we try to start getting feedback with a positive. It sounds like you did a good job and we need to change this and this. Great. But I bet that feels a bit authentic. Like, oh gosh, I've got to try and maybe make it sound like something in here is good, but all I can see is the negative. Um, so a really good example. Now, instead, if you focused on everything you loved about being able to give feedback, like, what do you love about being, like, feedback, I think so often our minds jump to the thought and the focus of, I'm going to have to disappoint somebody. I have to tell somebody that they didn't do it right. Uh, it becomes very negative. So how about instead the focus shifts to, this is such a privilege to help somebody grow, to help them see that they, how they can learn. What an amazing privilege. And today I'm going to make somebody stronger for getting the chance to give them feedback. So you can have that as your focus and then think about the bit you're focused on on them because I bet you're focused on a little bit of, they're not gonna like me when I give them the feedback um, or they're not gonna take it well, especially if you decided somebody doesn't take feedback very well. But just check your focus. Am I focused on the fact um, that they're brilliant or am I focused on the fact that they're not very good at their job because they're needing this feedback, right? Because you can still shift the focus on them into and like literally thinking about this person is capable of brilliance. They're absolutely, and in fact, this is like a default for me, even if I'm teaching, I'm coaching, I'm never sat there thinking this person is awful. I have to communicate with the part of them that's full of potential. 
So communicate the part of them that's totally able to take this feedback and fly, right? Now, Miriam, can you have a go for me? At what would you say to them if it's now a privilege to give feedback and you're totally focused on the part of them that is going to take this and run and be brilliant with the feedback? See if you can have a go and others of you can have a go at trying out what would I say if I was in that situation and just see what comes as a language shift. And I'm tempted to give you a bit of time to try it out so that I don't put words in your mouth. But if you're thinking about how exciting it is to help somebody and how great they're going to be as a result of the feedback, it might be that your words change even too much, but how it comes across is different. So whilst we're um, giving Miriam time to potentially give us some feedback. Oh, brilliant, thank you. So you would say, it's incredible working with you. I think your work helped us see more clear the X project and we can work from here. Great, right. So what I want you to notice is that it isn't anything changing other than where you have put your focus. You don't have to worry about structuring the sentence. In fact, what's happening is when you're worried about structuring the sentence, the mindset is a place of worrying about structuring the sentence, right? And that's your focus. Whereas if you shift it into something way more helpful, I don't want you to be unrealistic. If someone really needs to, um, you know, make changes, then great, make changes, but don't make making changes wrong or a bad thing. Make making changes a great thing. And that's really, really powerful and shifting things. So I really want you to go back and you can do this with emails. You can go back to emails, especially with people who you found a bit problematic and just check, reread your messaging and have a look at the words you found, how you structured your sentences and think about what was my focus. And if I could shift my focus into the part of them that I see all the potential in or the, I, the bits that I really admire, like, you know, maybe they are a bit difficult, but maybe you really can admire, like, how compassionate they are with their colleagues or even compassionate with their families. How would you frame things if you talk to that part of them? And you'll notice you can find a new set of words, a new way of phrasing sentences that allows you to have much, much better rapport and connection with people that's really authentic. So I hope that's answered, answered your question. Um, thank you so much, though. It's a brilliant, brilliant question to work through. Louise, I don't know if you've had any others come through on the Q&A. Not for the time being. So you have 30 seconds for your last chance to ask a question. <laughs> so pipe fast. It's the question. So. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. That was for Miriam. Yeah. <laughs> so no more questions? Uh, oh, no, there's a question. Mm. Okay, someone, and I don't know if uh, he wants to come in or not. Uh, someone that was in a meeting and two people start talking in their native language that he does not understand and he felt annoyed but mm -hmm. uh, at the same time uh, and i'm reading it's easier than putting in the third person i didn't tell them that i was annoyed because i didn't want to appear sensitive and vulnerable what is yeah. the best yeah. approach to deal with that issue oh i love that and i love that you first of all i love that you knew that it wasn't right to communicate that you were annoyed. You, you know, you checked that. But unfortunately, all that polyvagal theory would have let them know in some way that you were annoyed. But the problem is, even if it was that you were annoyed about them communicating in their um, native language, it probably would have come across, not that you were annoyed, but maybe you were a bit abrupt or a bit cold as a person. So we're not very good at reading other people's mindsets very well. We're really, really bad at reading other people's mindsets. So the, the problem is that if the annoyance is here, like we've got to find a way of managing that 
and communicating from a different place entirely. Otherwise, we're going to people are going to think we're a bit cold or a bit aggressive or a bit, you know. So if I'd been a fly on the wall, I might have said to you, oh, you came across as a bit abrupt, you know, because that may have been how it came, that annoyance came across to other people. So one of the beautiful things is wonderful that you felt it. So you just acknowledge it and you go, okay, I'm feeling annoyed. You don't ignore it. You just go, it's okay. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling annoyed. And it's absolutely okay to feel annoyed right now. Just let it be there. But you, we talk about a lot about this wisdom of relationship with our thoughts and our emotions. You almost want to have like a little quick internal conversation with it. You don't need to say this out loud and sound crazy. But internally you go, yes, hello, annoyance. I can see you're there. All right. I'm feeling annoyed. Right. Is it helpful if I stay feeling annoyed? No. Right. What is going to be way more helpful for me in this moment instead? So I don't know if you can pop into the chat box what would for you be a much more helpful emotion to have with those people in the room other than annoyance? What would be a more helpful emotion for you? And you can focus on what would be a more helpful emotion. And remember that the, your thoughts are still focused on the fact that they were speaking in their native tongue. What is an, another thing for you to focus on about them that's more helpful? So it might be, I don't know, you love the project they're working on, or you think they've got brilliant minds, or you love their dress sense. But anything that is more helpful as a focus than the fact they've just spoken in their native tongue together. So, Louise, I'm not sure if you're getting any chat back from our lovely... Not from the person that passed, but I have several questions that popped in in the meantime. In the meantime. Well, let me wrap but up. I, then. I'm so just giving the, the person a chance to react to you. And if he doesn't, then I will just go with the other questions. Okay. So, what I can say is that if you can ask, if you can say to yourself, right, the more helpful thing is for me to stay excited about this meeting. So you have the conversation with the annoyance, I can see you're there, but it's way more helpful for me to stay excited. You ask yourself, what am I excited about? You get connected with that feeling. You get reconnected with the feeling of the excitement of meeting with these people, the things you do like about them, and you do a very quick state shift. To get yourself into, okay, I'm, I'm excited. So now you're going to communicate from that place of excitement. And it's even better if you can like feel it in your body. We talk about embodiment being so important. If you can feel the place where excitement sits, uh, for me, it often sits in my cheeks. You know, they're like, mm, excited. So just put my focus back on my cheeks and the excitement and the thing I'm, the thing I do love about them, the thing I am excited about, and then that is what's going to come out. Uh, that's going to be the source of my next thing I say to them instead of so rude talking in your mother tongue. <laughs> okay, I hope that's been helpful. Yes, he just thanked you and for the very helpful answer. Another yes. question is whether you would recommend for people to prepare in advance to a talk like with breathing exercises, not eating chocolate, etc. Yeah, I think there's so many beautiful things you can do. Like preparation is everything. Preparation, uh, like obviously the chocolate thing is because you don't want all the mucus from the communicating. That's a really good one. Being hydrated actually is one of the most powerful things because your hydration has an impact on your breathing. Um, but absolutely, um, anything that hijacks your body and your mind and your emotions into being in their most powerful place is a really beautiful thing. Um, I feel very like the SIT delegates, um, the finalists are going to get all of this in the next couple of months. We're going to be talking about how you state shift uh, in lots and lots of different ways. But um, these exercises to get the mind and the emotion in the right place, beautiful. Your body will then follow. So any tips that you have for breathing, like cardiac coherence breathing is so powerful. And it's just when you breathe in for a shorter time than you breathe out, that's beautiful at tricking the body into being relaxed. So anything, if you're going to do a presentation, anything that puts you into a state 
of peace and relaxation and comfort means you're going to communicate from your safest place and oh, it will be beautiful. So as long as you're anything you can do to focus your body and your mind to go into that place is wonderful. Since we are getting to the time, I don't know if this is a question or if it's more a comment, if you want to react, which is, you know, in my case, being more like the cat brings me a problem. Sometimes I take more time than I would like to answer uh, it written. So that's uh, the statement. So I don't know if you want to react with these before we adjourn for the day. Yeah, we can probably be very quick. Um, I love that you're being like the cat and you're really thinking about what you want to do. But I suspect what might be happening is that that cat-like focus of the attention is on what should I say, what should I say, it needs to be perfect. And I suspect then that actually the focus you have is it needs to be perfect, which is probably causing your body to go into a bit of stress. And that isn't a helpful place to communicate from. So rather put yourself into a say, my focus is, I can write this quickly. I can get the, the words out really easily. I'm going to really enjoy this. It's not going to take me a long time. I've totally got it. Try that as the focus and try making sure the emotions are, I'm going to enjoy it. What a privilege to communicate with this person today. I'm going to enjoy this. Um, I suspect the cat-like attention is to do with perfectionism rather than really a relaxed state of communicating. So I hope in a very quick answer that's given you something to think about. Okay, thank you so much, Kim, for a very one hour of the tips on how to communicate for impact. We'll be here on July 1st, if I'm not mistaken. No. July, the first or second. Okay. Think. So anyway, you have now on your screen a webinar a webinar, a survey to, to answer with a few questions. And if I, you know, I, can, I wish we were all in the same room and we could clap for a great one hour of tips on communication. So I'll do it on my own since we cannot all do it. So thank you and see you next week for the next webinar. See you next week. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.